You're listening to the Jewel City Podcast. Make sure to rate the podcast and share it with your friends. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. We have something for all ages or online at 10 a.m. And make sure to check out our live groups or small groups. In this podcast, we'll hear a message from a special guest, Pastor Dave Marsh of Crossroads Church in Deep Creek, Maryland. Good evening, Jewel City. Y'all sound great. You sound great this evening. Pastor, uh, always an honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation. I was thinking this week, uh, you and I have been doing life and ministry together for over 15 years now. Uh, it, is, it is amazing how uh, quickly uh, our lives are passing. Can all the old people say amen? <laughs> amen. But uh, wow, so good to be here, to be able to worship with you. City Church, we love uh, what God is doing here. We're excited uh, about just continued new things and and how he's working uh, in this area. As most of you probably know, Patty and I are from uh, this area, Fairmont area. And of course, I grew up everywhere around Marion County. So this feels like home to us. And uh, we we preached uh, in Elkins this morning. We stayed in in, uh, down there near the church. And I knew when I got up, you know, normally you see those continental breakfasts, you see two stale donuts. Nuts and uh, you know, in a in a three week old ding dong. Come on, somebody! And uh, when when I walked in there today, they had biscuits and gravy, and I knew I was back home. I knew I was back home in God's uh, in God's country. But uh, anyway, we're going to get into the message. Uh, Matthew chapter 16 is where we're going to be this evening. Matthew chapter 16 and uh, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Who do men say that I, the son of man, uh, am? Uh, As we open up uh, our Bibles this evening, we are we're finding ourselves in the midst of a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And he says, boys, he says, what are people saying about me? You ever wonder what people are saying about you? <laughs> I found out that most of the times it's better not to know. Come on. <laughs> Just keep on trucking. Just keep on trucking. But uh, they're saying, who, who are people saying that I am? And uh, as we read through the Bible, we'll see that every time a person encountered Jesus, it produced a question. Doesn't matter who it is. Every time they encountered the Son of God, it would produce a question in them and saying, who is this guy? I mean, there's something different about him. Who, who is he? And, and some people who weren't real spiritual minded, they go, you know, that's Mary and Joe's boy. I'm glad you're on the front row. You're going to help me all night. And uh, that's Mary and Joe's boy. You know, he made your coffee table. You know, he, he made your coffee table. He's, he's a real good carpenter. His prices are reasonable. <laughs> prices are reasonable. He, he, he was preaching the whole time he was building that coffee table. Remember, you got him to, you got him to do that, uh, that dining room table for your daughter when she got married. Oh, yeah, real, real nice boy. And some others would say, well, you know what? Uh, I know some carpenters, but I never met one like him. Like, like I've seen some carpenters walk on roofs before, but I ain't never seen a carpenter walk on a water. Like there's, there's something different about this. I've never seen a carpenter cast out a demon. There is just something different. And, and, and others would say, oh, I'll tell you what's different. Some would say, well, he's John the Baptist who's come back from the dead, or he's Elijah, or he's one of the prophets that's been reincarnated. You see, anyone who encountered Jesus always had to ask this question, who is he? Well, friends, in our day and age, people are still asking, who's Jesus? But the trend that concerns me in this culture is, is everyone is answering that question differently. We live in a day where Jesus is being defined however we want to define him. We have people lifting him up out of this book and then draping any flag over him they choose to. That's what we, we, some people say he's a Republican Jesus. Some people say he's a Democrat Jesus or a libertarian Jesus, or they define Jesus by their own experiences or their own emotions or their own intellect or lack thereof. Hello, somebody. We live in a day that you can just add Jesus to any cause you want to add him to. 
But here's the deal tonight, Jewel City Church. The scripture teaches us that you and I should be molded and shaped into an image of Jesus Christ. We should not be molding and shaping Jesus into our own image. I hear people say all the time, well, my Jesus wouldn't say that. I I hear people say, my Jesus wouldn't feel that. People talk about Jesus like somehow we can all have our own version of Jesus. I'm thinking, hold up, sis. Jesus ain't sweet frog. Right? You can't customize Jesus. Jesus is not Starbucks. You can't add an extra pump of pumpkin spice or like my wife, make mine with almond milk. No, Jesus is not customizable. He is who he is and who he is has already been defined by this book. Somebody say he's in the book. He's in the book. You see, the presence of Jesus will always produce questions, but they must be answered by the word of God. Not by opinion, not by experience, not by the news cycle, not by culture. You cannot redefine him. And some people say, Pastor, do you, do you, do you expect me to believe that this old outdated book written thousands of years ago, do you expect us to believe the book? Well, I would say if you're going to follow Jesus, you better follow this book because he did. Do you know that Jesus treated the entire Bible as truth? Jesus quoted the Old Testament 78 times. He called it the scriptures, the word of God, and the wisdom of God. Do you know that the stories that people will laugh at today and mock us and ridicule us and say, I can't believe you guys believe these things. Do you know that Jesus believed them? He taught them as truth. How about Matthew chapter 12? Jesus taught about Jonah and the great fish. We call it Jonah and the whale. Scripture says the great fish. But people laugh at that. They mock us. They say, do you really believe that a man was swallowed by a whale and lived to tell about it? Well, Jesus believed it and he likened it to his own resurrection. How about that crazy guy who built a boat when it had never rained? You you realize it had never rained. He's out there 120 years building a boat. But not, not only did Jesus treat Jonah's story as true, but He treated Noah and his ark as truth, and he likened it in Luke 17 to his own second coming. How about when the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were judged for their sin, and a man named Lot had a wife who didn't want to leave? Remember the angels came, they said, Lot, we're about to destroy this place. Get your wife, get your daughters, get them out of here. Grab them by the hand. He's trying to get them out of the city before it gets destroyed. And what did Lot's wife do? She looked back, and what happened? pillar of salt. People would say, do you expect me to believe that a woman turned to a pillar of salt? Number one, I'll just say this. All the women I know are salty. (laughs) Come on. I'm just kidding. It's a joke, ma'am. It's a joke. Come on, lighten up a little bit. I mean, there's some truth in it, but anyway, (laughs) but do you know Jesus used that story? Not as a fable, not as a myth. He taught that story, taught it as truth to show us that he is a God that will judge. Judgment is part of the love of God. Jesus was a preacher and teacher of the Bible, folks. That's why it's so important to attend a church like this. Because this church has a high view of scripture. I've often told our church, I said, hey, if I get hit by a bus. Now listen, I don't know why preachers say that. Apparently, the probability of preachers getting hit by a bus must be high because preachers always say that. But anyway, I say, if I get get hit by a bus, don't you dare stick someone in our pulpit that does not preach and teach out of the word of God. Right? Do you... Do you realize there are churches who've gathered all over the world today and they will sing and they will light candles and they will go through rituals, but sadly, many of them will never open up the word of God, never boldly proclaim it. Friends, don't go to that church because I don't want to hear a preacher's opinion. When I go to church, I want to hear the word of God because it's only the word of God that can get down deep on the inside of a heart of a man or a woman and change them from the inside out. It's only the word of God that's truth. That's why the apostle Paul told a young preacher named Timothy, he said, Timothy, don't get sidetracked with arguments and fables and speculations. Don't get off course with the philosophies of this world. No, Timothy, when you step behind this pulpit, Timothy, preach the word. That's what he told him. Jesus was a preacher and teacher of the Bible. 
Somehow we, we've, we tried to separate him from the scriptures. But you can't do it. He referred to him over and over and over again. You see, what happens is, is we think we are smarter than the people in the Bible. And so we walk around quoting Satan and saying, hath God really said? That's what Satan said, right? In the early chapters of Genesis, God gave them clear instructions. Satan came along to Eve and says, hath God really said? And today we live in a culture that says, hath God really said that about marriage? Hath God really said that about sex? Hath God really said that about the way I treat my wife? Oh, I'm preaching good now, huh, sister? Yeah, see? That's what we're doing. C.S. Lewis says that every generation suffers from what he called chronological snobbery. The idea is, is that every generation thinks we're smarter than our parents. We did it too, right? We did it too. There was a time when we were, uh, it depend on, you know, I mean, how dumb you are, you started earlier. <laughs> but, but when you were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, you thought you knew everything. You thought your mom and dad were as dumb as a box of rocks. They don't know what they're talking about. They're old school. They, they don't know what the world is like now. They haven't grown up during this time. They are clueless. And if they just knew half of what I knew, they'd be okay. How old were you when you realized your dad was pretty smart? How old were you when you realized, you know what? I guess mama did have some wisdom. My dad turned 95 last week. We had a little party for him. He has, he, he has a sixth grade education. 95 years old. If he was running for office, I'd vote for him way before I would any of these other politicians. Come on, somebody. Because he has wisdom. Chronological snobbery says if it's newer, it's got to be truer. I'm going to say that again. Chronological snobbery, this is what C.S. Lewis taught, that it's the mindset of if it's newer, it must be truer. Therefore, we take Jesus and we attempt to customize him to fit us. Thomas Jefferson did that. Thomas Jefferson loved the teachings of Jesus, but he couldn't wrap his mind around the miracles. So you know what he did? He cut them out. He said, I'll take Jesus, but hold the miracles. It's like he was ordering a Big Mac. I'll take the Big Mac, but hold the special sauce. He thought you could customize Jesus. And he produced an 84-page volume in 1820, bounded in red leather like this, and titled it The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. He literally went through the Bible and said, I like this part. I can understand it. I'll leave it in there. But when he got to the parts that he couldn't comprehend, like the miracles, he cut them out. So, for example, he left the in the part where Jesus died, but he cut out the resurrection. No offense, Mr. Jefferson, and I know I'm just a hillbilly from West Virginia, but a dead Jesus is not a Jesus at all. Our entire faith is built on the fact that we serve a resurrected, risen Christ. <laughs> we don't get to cut out the parts we'd like. If I got to cut out some things that I would like to cut out, I'd probably start with this one. Love your enemies. I'm being honest with you. I'd cut that one out because it does not come naturally to me. I'll tell you what comes naturally to me. Throat punch your enemies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jab your enemies' <laughs> eyes out with a fork. I, I mean, that's what comes naturally to me. But listen, I don't get to customize him. I don't get to customize him. Friends, we got to stick with the Jesus of the Bible. I got to move here. Jesus was a preacher and teacher of scripture. One of my favorite examples of this is found on actually on Easter Sunday morning. Easter Sunday morning, the first one. I know Jewel City did Easter upright. I watched it on live stream. You guys, you know, you know how to do Easter. You celebrate, you party. It is awesome. We do too. But on that first Easter Sunday morning, there was no party. And, and most of the disciples did not believe that he had, he had risen from the grave. And they were depressed and they were downtrodden and they were sad. And two of them went on this walk on a, on a road to Emmaus and Jesus shows up and he begins to talk to them, but they don't know that it's, that it's him. 
And so they begin to tell him everything that's happened. They share their sadness with him, thinking he was still dead. But I want you to look at Luke 24. Luke 24, I want you to see what Jesus did to these guys. Luke 24 and verse 25, then Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? And watch this now, verse 27, when someone is, needs to know who Jesus is, I want you to know what Jesus himself does. He went to the scriptures. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses, everybody say Moses. And all the prophets, say the prophets. The same Old Testament that you and I have right now, that's what Jesus went to. And watch what he did. It said, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He is a walking miracle, but yet he brings them back to this. When we talk about having a high view of scripture, we're saying it is written is higher than our own experiences. It is written is higher than my opinions. It is written is higher than what culture says is cool and not cool. Jesus, the walking miracle, brings the boys to what is written and he begins in Moses, so book of Genesis, and all the way through, systematically, he begins to show them how the entire Bible is written about him. Now, we don't know where he started. We don't know exactly where he started, but he might have started right there in the first couple of chapters of the Bible when, you know, Adam and Eve had sinned. They'd been uh, tempted by Satan, tempted by their own flesh, and they gave in and they sinned, and their fellowship with God was broken, and God made a promise. He said, listen, one day the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the head of Satan. Jesus might have started right there, looked him in the eyes, and says, boys, I am the seed of the woman. We don't know for sure, but he could have. Or maybe he jumped over there to Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, we see a man named Abraham taking Isaac, his only son, to a place called Mount Moriah, which just happens to be in the same area where Jesus was crucified. And Isaac, as a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, carries the wood on his back to this place of the sacrifice, just like Jesus carried the crossbeam on his back. But just as Isaac is about to be sacrificed, God stops him and instead provides a ram to be sacrificed. Jesus might have said, boys, that, that ram right there, that sacrifice, that was me. Can you imagine having a personal Bible study with Jesus Christ. And he goes scripture by scripture by scripture, showing them how this entire book is written about him. Anthony, do you think he might have taken him over to the prophet Daniel, showed him that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? showed them how they were thrown in that fiery furnace and they should have been immediately incinerated from the flames, but instead the king looks around and he says, something ain't right, somebody clean my glasses. Give, give me a Kleenex, something ain't right, because I swear we threw three men in the fire, but there's a fourth man in the fire walking around and he looks like the son of God. Jesus might have said, do you know who that fourth man was? That's me. Or maybe he would have taken him over to Daniel in the lion's den. And you know the story. Daniel should have been thrown in there and ripped to shreds. But instead, Daniel grabs a lion by the mane, uses him for a pillow, wakes up feeling good and refreshed the next day. And Jesus might have said, boys, on the road to Emmaus, who do you think was the lion tamer in that den? The lion tamer was me. Here's the point. Systematically, he showed them how this entire Bible is about him. Look at Luke 24. This is the end of that story, verse 32. And they said to one another, it, it was like they finally realized it's Jesus. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the what? Scriptures. Friends, if we want to know Jesus... If we want our hearts to burn with passion for him, we must know the scriptures. He's in the book. 
Somebody say he's in the book. Say he's in the book. Listen, I talked to a woman this morning. Her heart was broken. She said, Pastor, actually, band, if you guys want to come and get in place. Now, listen, these are just normal, regular people. I love them, but they're just normal folks, and they are going to walk up here and get their instruments on. Please stay focused. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) She said, Pastor, pray for my son. She said he was saved, he was baptized, he was in the youth group, he was in the Christmas play, he was serving the Lord, and then he went to college. Come on. I said, sister, your story is is not unlike many other stories that I'm hearing. It's because they go off to college and the world begins to redefine Jesus to them. And a lot of times it's even way before college. It's the world that we're living in. People come along and they say, hath God really said? Did Jesus really believe that? Does Jesus really teach that? They, they creates a crisis of faith in our kids and in our grandkids. And I know Pastor Robert kicked off a new series and we were talking about battle, but I'm telling you this church, I, I'm sure it'll get covered here in this series. We have to become experts. We have to become masters using the sword of the spirit to fight for our marriages to fight for our kids, to fight for our grandkids. Otherwise, we will become deceived. Let me show you one more scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the Apostle Paul. Verse 3, Paul says this, but I fear, everybody say fear. I fear. Now, it's interesting to me. The Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy and says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? But here in 2 Corinthians, he says, I fear something. What do you fear, Paul? I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4 says, For if he who come preaches another Jesus, a different Jesus, from whom we have not preached, or if you have received a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, now here's what he fears, that you may well put up with it. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I'm afraid that after I'm gone, if someone comes along and they redefine Jesus. And it, he, he's, he's similar to what I taught you, but he's a little bit different. And they create another Jesus. Here's my fear. My fear is that you'll tolerate it. My fear is that you'll compromise. My fear is that you'll put up with it. Church, I know we live in a culture that screams for tolerance, but tolerance of error is not a Christian value. Don't put up with it. Paul uses strong language here because he knows that a redefined Jesus is not Jesus at all. The church is not a marketplace of ideas where all ideas are given the same credence and weight. The church is a place where truth is proclaimed and just as importantly, error is rejected. One of the hardest parts of our job is to stand behind this pulpit because, I mean, everybody loves you when you preach a shout and hallelujah message. But one of the hardest parts of our job is to stand behind this pulpit and correct error that is trying to come into the church or correct error that has got into a life group or correct error that some TV preacher, you know, got his message into your church or correct error that culture has tried to redefine Jesus with. But if you study the Bible, most of the Old Testament is the true prophets of God correcting the false prophets of God. And most of the New Testament are the true apostles of God, the elders and the pastors of teachers and and teachers correcting the false teachers. It's part of the job. The church cannot just believe whatever you want about Jesus. Church, he's in the book. And if you want to know what he thinks about something, it's written. If you want to know what Jesus feels about something, it is written. If you want to know what he would do in a situation, it's in here. His principles to govern your life are all in the book. We don't worship a book, but this 
collection of 66 books is the inspired Word of God. And if we truly want to know Jesus, His character, His nature, His thoughts, His emotions, they're all found in there. He's in the book. Years ago, I met an older man who was a great teacher of God's Word. His name was O'Neill Carmen. He was from Kentucky, and he's with the Lord now. But he would tell us this. He would say, if you look close enough, you will see Jesus in every book of the Bible. And then he had it memorized and he would take about four minutes and he would take, take you on a journey. And I'm just gonna ask you, you got, you got four more minutes in you? I hope you got 15, but go ahead, stand up. Stand up with me. Let's take a little walk through scripture. Here's the point tonight. If you wanna know Jesus, he's in the book. He himself, witnessing to people who had doubted his existence his existence what did he do he opened the scriptures to them if we're going to if we're going to win in the battle that's our offensive weapon sword of the spirit so let's walk through the scriptures in genesis jesus christ is the seed of the woman in exodus he's the passover lamb in leviticus he is our great high priest in numbers he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like Moses. And in Joshua, he is the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he is our judge and our lawgiver. And in Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, he is that seed of David. And in Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he is the faithful scribe. And in Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of all the broken pieces of our lives. Anybody got some brokenness that needs healed tonight? He is that restorer. In Esther, he is our Mordecai, our advocate. And in Job, he is our sovereign God and our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd. And in Proverbs, he is my wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is the meaning of life. And in Song of Solomon, he is the lover of our souls. In Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. You need some peace tonight? You got Jesus. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he's the weeping prophet who cries when we cry. In Ezekiel, it is he who gives life to the dry bones. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In in Hosea, he is our faithful husband who restores his backslidden wife. In Joel, it's Jesus who pours out the Holy Spirit. And in Amos, he's the one who bears our burdens. In Obadiah, he's our judge and savior. And in Jonah, he is the risen prophet. In Micah, he is the ruler of the world from the tiny town of Bethlehem. And in Nahum, he is our stronghold. In Habakkuk, he's our watchman. In Zephaniah, scripture says he's the God who gets up off of his throne and he sings songs of love over his people. In Haggai, he's the one who restores. In Zechariah, he's the branch of David and the one who was pierced for us all. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he's the king of the Jews. He's the Messiah. He is the king of of Israel and in Mark he is the servant and the miracle worker. In Luke he's that baby who was born in the manger. He's the son of man. In John he's the son of God, the living word. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. In the book of Acts, scripture says he is the only name under heaven by which men can and must be saved. In Romans, he's the one who justifies. In Corinthians, he is our resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, he's our comfort. In Galatians, Jesus is our freedom. In Ephesians, he's the head of this church. And in Philippians, Jesus Christ is our joy. In Colossians, he's the one who completes us. He's the glue that holds this whole world together. And in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he is our coming king. In 1 and 2 Timothy, he's the one mediator between God and man. That means tonight if you need to come to the throne of grace, you don't need a prophet, you don't need a pastor, you don't need a priest, you don't need a preacher. You can come boldly to the throne of grace all by yourself because the blood of Jesus made himself available to you. In Philemon, he's our benefactor. In Titus, he's our blessed hope. In Hebrews, he is our perfection. In James, he's the power behind our faith. And in 1st and 2nd Peter, he is our chief shepherd and our chief cornerstone. In 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John, he is love. In Jude, he's the foundation of our faith and our security. And in Revelation, he's seated 
on a white horse with a robe that has been dipped in his own blood and written on his thigh is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Church, this entire book from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the eternal God who made everything we can see and everything we cannot see. Not only did he make it, but he's holding it all together today by the power of his word. He was bruised for our sin. He was despised for our shame. He was dead, but the grave could not hold him. The world cannot comprehend him and the armies cannot defeat him. Educators cannot explain him and politicians can't ignore him. Yes, he suffered as a lamb led to the slaughter, but when he comes back, he's not coming back as a lamb. He shall return as the lion of the tribe of Judah to rule in righteousness and of his kingdom. There shall be no end. Somebody worship him tonight. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Oh, he's so good. He's so good. Come on, we're going to do one more song tonight. And I know you guys gathered down front. Just come on. Come on. Come on down front. Come on down front. I'll tell you, when I see everything that Jesus is to us, I can't help but worship him. I can't help but thank him. I can't help but praise him. Let's sing this song. Let's lift his name up. If you've got a situation in your life that's beyond your control, sing his name tonight. God, we love you. We bless you, Lord, God. There's no one else who is like you. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord.
As we are gathered here tonight, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're here on purpose. God brought you here. He loves you with an incredible love. This Jesus that we just talked about, the 66 books, that Jesus died for you. God loved you so much that he was willing to trade the life of his son for yours. He was willing to take your sin and my sin, place it upon his son. He became our sin. He died in our place so that you and I could be the children of God. If you're here tonight and, and, and you're not certain of your relationship with Jesus, maybe at one time you had a relationship with him, but you've walked away, you've been doing your own thing, making your own decisions, not really been serving God, Maybe tonight he's put his hand upon you. He's opened your eyes. He's drawing you back. I know on a Sunday evening like this, most of us here, we're, we're, we're believers, we're saved, we've been baptized, we love the Lord. But if there's anyone here who needs to begin or, or renew a relationship with Jesus Christ, would you just raise your hand right now? You just just need to begin again just need to start over so God I I need to renew that relationship with you see this gentleman here any others if that's you would you just say Lord Jesus forgive me of my sin cleanse me of my past I need to start over Lord I need a fresh touch. I want to know you, God. I want to serve you. I want you to use my life for your glory. Friends, our God is so awesome. His mercy is so good. His faithfulness is so incredible that no matter where we've been or what we've done, he accepts us back home. And in fact, scripture says that heaven rejoices over a lost sinner who would come home. Come on, that's the goodness of our God. Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. Make sure to rate the podcast and share with your friends. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. We have something for all ages or online at 10 a.m. Make sure to check out our live groups or small groups. 